You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. This episode is presented to you by Purina Pro Plan and Boss Shot Shells. Go slow. Take your time. Don't push. Throw the timelines out the window. You know, when somebody says, well, by the time your puppy's 12 weeks old, it should be doing this. Not necessarily. Take your time. Go slow. Let the dog really learn one skill before throwing the next thing at it. Don't try to do everything at once. You know, just because a dog has done something correctly a time or two doesn't mean it knows it. It's just guessing right at that point. Really solidify the lesson before you move on to the next thing. Take your time and go slow. Hey all, I am down in Houston at the NRG Center this week with the ProPlan team. So if you're here for the event, be sure to stop by and say hi and get your pup some ProPlan samples and yourself some Purina swag. Are you a Pro Club member yet? If you own five dogs or more, or you're a breeder, then you are qualified to be in the Pro Club. You get 14% back for dog food that you feed, free puppy kits is sent home with new owners, swag when you visit us at any event we're at, and you help benefit the AKC Canine Health Foundation and your National Breed Club, all by just feeding your dogs Purina Pro Plan, the very best. Send me a message if you aren't a member, but you're interested in signing up for the program. Boss Shot Shells. Boss is a big advocate for patterning your shotgun. I'll be honest, until Lee Chose of Boss told me I needed to do this, I had never heard of it before. Whatever game you pursue, whether it be feathered or clay targets, you need to know the capabilities of your gun in the field and on the range. You should check routinely to see if your shotgun is safe and performing properly, but you should also know your spread. No two shotguns perform exactly alike, even those that came off the same assembly line and have the same choke and same shot shell load. Here is Boss's three-step instruction on how to pattern your gun. Number one, cut paper or cardboard into roughly 48 by 48 inch targets, nothing fancy. This gives you enough room to see your pattern, even if your point of aim is off a bit. If it's off, no big deal. That's normal. Start at 30 yards. It's a good starting point. Draw an X or dot to aim at and shoot offhand. Not on a bench. Nobody shoots off a bench. Shoot the target. Shoot another one at 40 yards or whatever distance fits your style of hunting. Step 3. Draw a 30-inch circle around the densest part of the pattern and mark the hits with a sharpie. Now do the math. Divide the number of pellets in the shell into the total number of hits in that 30-inch circle. Move the decimal point two places and that is your percentage. Once you've patterned your gun, head out for a good time at the Sporting Clays course like I did this past weekend. Several of us met up at the Big Sky Sporting Clays in Polson, Montana. I didn't shoot with my usual go-to, the Siren Tempio Light, and instead I took the gun that's more ideal for a mix of sporting clays and upland, the Siren Elos D2. I'm always looking for ways to improve and have never had the opportunity for actual shooting instruction. So on August 21st and 22nd, I'm heading to Minnesota for Project Upland's instinctual wing shooting course. I'm looking forward to having well-known instructors Tracy Wright and Kate Onstrom giving me some tips. If you guys could use some help with shooting as well, go to projectupland.com and click on the events tab. The awesome folks at Siren, Cesar Guarini, and Fab Arm will also have demo guns there for you to use and try out. Dakota 283. Patreon patrons, you guys are doing such an awesome job at entering the giveaway for a G3 medium kennel or a Dine and Dash. Become a Patreon patron. Go to patreon.com forward slash the bird dog babe to become a patron. Write a review, then send me a screenshot of it and you're entered. I'll be drawing the winners on September 1st. Dakota 283 is dedicated to building unparalleled pet protection and tailgate lifestyle products for you and your best friends. So check out their website, dakota283.com to view the full lineup of kennels, truck bed storage, food and water storage, pet grooming bathtubs, and gear. And be sure to use promo code BIRDDOGBABE for 10% off your purchase. 
My guest today is Sharon Potter of Red Branch Kennels in Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. Sharon learned from and was mentored by Rick Smith to be a Team Hunt Smith instructor. She trains pointers, retrievers, and spaniels, though Chesapeake Bay Retrievers are her personal breed of choice. She's known to be a trainer that takes on the problem dogs that most others usually don't want to mess with, like those that are gun-shy and hard-mouthed. Sharon shares a lot of great advice in this episode, as well as an upcoming training opportunity for a ladies bird dog workshop. All right, let's get after it. I have been doing horses first and then dogs my entire life. Um, According to my parents, my second word after mama was horsey. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't know where that came from because none, none of the rest of my family is really horse oriented at all. And so I've just been kind of addicted to to animals and animal behavior since I was a little kid. So that kind of progressed. Um, I took a slight detour due to parental pressure uh, and ended up getting a degree in music because they did not think my choice of career with horse training was appropriate and never used that degree. (laughs) um, And so I've been training dogs and horses ever since. Cool. So you're training, you're training horses right now as well? Well, I, I kind of retired from doing that professionally about 10, 10 or 12 years ago now, okay. um, about 12 years ago. I've decided, you know, as I get older, I don't bounce as well as I used to. And while a dog can bite me, it's not likely to put me in a wheelchair. Mm. Right. So right. I still have my own horses and I do, you know, do, do mess around with them. I've got one mare I'm going to breed and I've got another one I'm taking to nationals in fall. But it's for me and I am an, officially an amateur as far as my status and I'm enjoying that. Okay. So what kind of horses do you have and, and what exactly do you train for? Um, I have three Arabians and then one thoroughbred mare. Okay. And the horse I'm taking to nationals is an Arabian gelding. Um, he's already won one national championship and a reserve. And I train in show and dressage. Nice. So that is really meticulous dressage, right? It is. Yes. Yeah. Do you feel that some of that structure that you had with dressage has carried itself or helped you with the dog training portion? Oh, absolutely. You know, what I like about it the most is it's a very slow, consistent way of training. You know, there's no rush. Like with the pleasure horses, it's quick. Get them to walk, trot, and canter and set their head a certain way. And in dressage, that goes completely out the window. We're developing the entire structure and and mind of the horse. And it's the same with the dogs, the same approach I like to use. Read the dog in front of you. Be very careful. Um, Don't push. Let the dog come at its own pace. Develop everything. Develop the entire dog. How long have you been training? Oh, let's see, about 17 years now. Okay. So how did that kind of start up in your life of the dog training when you were so fluent with the horses did was it dogs that you met came into your life how did that work well I've always ever since I was an adult and on my own I've always had a gun dog of my own and I enjoyed hunting and that kind of thing but I was still very very committed to the horses and it's funny, life throws you these little spins on occasion. And through a horse client of mine, who happened to always host initially a Delmar Smith seminar and then a Rick Smith seminar, um, he said, Sharon, you, you've got gun dogs. You should really come watch one of these seminars that Rick does. Mm-hmm. So through Marty, I got to know Rick Smith, and we got talking and stuff. And he wanted to do some articles in a book. And we still do 20 years now. We've been doing the pointing dog journal articles. And as I started doing more of the writing for Rick, people started asking me if I'd train their dog. And that was about the time I decided maybe it was a good idea to swap careers. Hmm. So it really, when you think about it, because everything I did horse wise, I was always working for somebody else's farm because I'm not independently wealthy enough to own a huge facility and all this stuff. So with the dogs, I don't need a one ton dually and a six horse trailer and, you know, $30,000 worth of tack 
and a barn and an indoor arena and pastures. I don't need all of that. I need game birds. I need fields. I need kennels. I need an e collar or a shotgun. I mean, it, it's much more minimal as far as output. Right. And again, it's a little safer. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot right. safer. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Big difference there. <laughs> yeah, but really, it was it was really through Rick and then Delmar Smith. Um, I had a great chance. And I at the time, I was still really hooked into the horses. And I just had my own Chesapeake that I hunted with. But I happened to be taking uh, Marty's daughter, Hannah, to her first youth nationals in Oklahoma City. And we had an opportunity to meet Delmar Smith there. And I didn't know who Delmar Smith was. I was completely new to this. And so he was anything involving horses. Delmar is there. He's very, very horse involved as well as dog involved. So I got to know him and he came and watched our workout sessions and watched all of the classes at the show and um, gave me a nice compliment at the end. And I didn't think much of it until later on. And I realized just who I'd been talking to. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's funny how that works. But I've been doing dogs ever since. Okay. So did you take some of their seminars? Did you go down there and mentor under them? Well, when I first met Rick, um, I only was able to see a couple of hours of one of the seminars and he was talked about doing some writing. And I said, really, Rick, I don't know your system. I don't, I'm not familiar with it. And I, I'm uncomfortable writing about something that I really haven't experienced and gotten into in great detail. Mm-hmm. Because coming from a retriever background and looking at the pointing dog side of things, it's just a lot of differences. And so we set up a bunch of seminars. Um, that first year, I traveled to Missouri and California and South Dakota and Canada. Um, eventually, the next year, New Zealand. Anywhere we, I could get time off from my job and go to a seminar, I did. And so I got enough of in-depth. I got to see a lot of people and a lot of dogs and really learn the system. And from there, uh, I spent some time on the Mariposa Ranch where they used to guide. Um, so I got that program down and got to know Ronnie. And it's just been, I kind of got grandfathered into the whole system. Mm-hmm. What is it about you, do you think, that they really honed in on your skills and you know, to the point where they wanted you to write articles reflecting their, the way that they train? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with Rick. When I first got to know him, he, you know, he was at a horse show because he knew Marty Smith. And when he just kind of watched the way I work with the horses, it seems similar enough. And of course he has a horse background too. Their whole family does. And I think he just kind of thought we would mesh well as far as the approach we have to training. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was a real easy transition to make because until he'd kind of watched me handle horses and stuff, he really didn't bring up much about doing any writing. And as we talked, it was kind of funny. We talked about doing a book, which that's another story. I'm not going to go there, (laughs) Um, but we thought, well, let's just do, do a feature piece and throw it at pointing dog journal and see what happens. And so back in that day, I mean, I typed it out and stuck it in a manila envelope and snail mailed it to the editor at pointing dog journal to Steve Smith. And he called me almost immediately and said, how would you like to make that a regular column? Which kind of surprised both of us, but we said, okay. (laughs) (laughs) And that was 20 years ago and we're still doing it. That's awesome. How often does that come out? Uh, It's every other month now. Okay. Six issues a year. Okay. What has been like one of your most popular topics that you get a lot of feedback on through that? Oh, gosh. Um, You know, we've had one article that we did, one column we did that they've actually reprinted on request from other people two or three times now. And the title of the article is Respect or Love. Hmm. And it's talking about what people look at. Human beings tend to think their dogs love them and dogs don't have that. That kind of love like we humans do. And you see that dog that looks up at its trainer with that adoring look and will do anything for that trainer. That's a respect level. It's not necessarily love. And people tend to use um, too much affection, too much treats. I mean, I'm not saying any of that is bad, but the dog looks at them as a walking vending machine rather than the leader of the pack. Mm -hmm. And if you get to the point where that dog gives you what the dog considers respect, and you have to look at things from the dog's culture, so to speak. 
which is completely different than ours. They have a very different moral code and everything else. Um, if you get the dog to respect you, that translates to what we think is love. And you can't bribe them into it. Right. Yeah. I think that is something that there is, there's this line that separates that and we can't recognize that as owners and, you know, they, and it's like that fur baby mentality, right? Very much. So I Mm -hmm. think if we just break things down and think, Delmar says it best. He said, in order to train a dog, you've got to think like a dog. And that's very true, but we have a hard time translating that. Um, A good example would be if you and I were meeting in person for the first time, we shake hands and say, hi. Two dogs, if they're meeting for the first time, sniff each other's butts. Mm-hmm. Now, in human language, oh, that's disgusting. Stop that. What the dogs, that's polite behavior. Hmm. Yeah, you, we have to look at things from a completely different cultural standpoint, and it's very, very difficult for a lot of people to do that. Right, right. But as soon as you start understanding what the dog is saying and, and what their language is, and they're talking to us and we're communicating to them all the time, even when we don't realize it. There's always conversation going on. If you can get that, things go so much quicker. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I'll have somebody bring a dog, especially a difficult dog, into the kennel. And as soon as I start handling that dog, you can see them relax and go, oh, thank heavens I found somebody that speaks the language. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like being thrown into a foreign country where you can't ask anybody where to find food or where the bathroom is because you can't speak the language and nobody understands you. It's a really frustrating situation for dogs and for people. Right. And do you think it's just a difficulty in being able to read dogs that that's something that we struggle with as trainers or as owners? If That's very true as well. And there are a lot of little subtleties, but there are some really big things that most people miss. Um, one example I use a lot. In fact, I just taught a lesson this afternoon and had to bring it up. If let's say you're walking a dog on the lead and you need to make a correction with that leash. And you make that correction and the dog shakes like they're shaking water off. People don't read anything into that, but that's really the canine version of the middle finger. Hmm. Interesting. They're, fli- they're, they're flipping off what you just did. Mm-hmm. They're shaking it off. They're, ugh, that's, that's out of here. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to pay attention to that. Like, what do you think it is like male dogs when you're out training with them, you know, they, they go through their sequence. They just bring you back the bird, um, the, the, the retrieve. And then they turn around and they cock their leg on the bush. What's, what's that about? Is that a, oh yeah, I'm a stud. I just it's did a, a great it's a job. Thing. It's a dominance thing and it's an ownership thing. Uh, okay. What I do here when I let my male dogs out to air, you find your tree or whatever and you lift your leg on it and you empty out once. There are no second shots. You will not mark anything. They're not claiming ownership. And as far as I'm concerned, none of my dogs have made a mortgage payment on this place yet and they don't own any of it. <laughs> I so, like that. <laughs> it's, I, I won't. I won't have it. And as soon mm-hmm. as I see a dog start to stop and cock their leg again, I'll nick them with a collar or a call, and I will make them move on and not allow it. Mm-hmm. I just don't. Right. And even it, you know through a healing sequence. So you would just stay on them if they if they just want to stop and and cock their leg on something. Oh, absolutely. Now that's that said. Assuming I've let them have their one chance to pee. If they need to go, they need to go and that's okay. Do Mm -hmm. it, but make sure you clean out because we're not stopping again. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's especially on healing. If you think about a dog at heel, whether they're on lead or off lead, if they've been told to heal, they have one job. Watch me. Mm -hmm. If they're looking around and staring and wanting to find a bush to cock their leg on, they're not watching me and they only have one job. I need mm-hmm. to keep that focus until I tell them they're released to do anything else. Right. What about tailgate drops? You open up the kennels and you might have two intact males and they both just start having a pissing match all over the field before they even want to start hunting or really focus on it because they just are running around each other marking. What, oh, we could step way that? back. I don't do it that way. Okay. Um, the first, let's say I'm hunting with somebody I've never met before and I don't know if their dog's trained or not. Everybody thinks their dog is, but a lot of them really aren't as trained as people <laughs> seem to think they are. Mm-hmm. So the first thing I'm going to say is, well, let's stretch these dogs out so we can hunt longer. Let's run yours first and then we'll put yours up for a rest and then we'll hunt mine. 
that gives me a chance to number one, evaluate that dog and see if we're going to have any issues. And number two, it gives the other guy a chance to hopefully then see a trained dog if his isn't. Mm -hmm. So then I'll decide whether or not I will hunt those dogs together. Okay. Now, backing up another step, when I train here at home, all the dogs go out on their, their tie-out chains in the morning when I start training. Okay. I've got room for 12 dogs on my stakeout chain. Every six feet, there's a dog. And we start that. It's like a school desk. Everybody sits there. The first dog that's chilled out and relaxed is the first dog that gets to go have some fun and hit the field. So that routine, and the dogs that are jumping around barking get nothing. They have to wait until they calm down before they get any attention at all. So as I go out hunting, I take a short length of chain, I snap it to the ring on the trailer hitch on the truck, and the other one goes to the dog's collar. When they come out of the crate, they immediately go straight to that chain. Mm -hmm. While I get my shotgun and my shells and my vest and get organized, then they're put on lead, and then we might only walk 10 feet. If we walk 10 feet and that dog is paying attention and being good, we cut him loose and go hunt. But there's a structured routine before turning loose. So the dog is already realizing, okay, it's exciting, it's hunting, but I'm still under control and I still have to listen and pay attention and do my job. I don't allow that, that you know, body slamming, goof off, you know, peeing match, like you said. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen. Right. And if I see the other dog is going to do it and be a problem, then we don't hunt together. Mm -hmm. So they've already learned that I don't get off this line unless I'm calm and chill. And so that way, when you take them hunting, and you, you have them um, on the line off the truck, you won't even grab them until they are in that same state of mind. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the neat part is they figure it out really fast. Sure. And I'm assuming after you pull them off the line, you're not just immediately letting them off to run. You're taking them from that to like a heel position until you're releasing them? Or what does that look like? Correct. Correct. And I use the Delmar Smith Wonder Lead exclusively. Okay. I like it. Okay. Um, and that took some convincing the first time I ever saw it. I thought, what, mm -hmm. what is this overpriced piece of rope thing? <laughs> right. Can you and explain then, that a little bit for listeners that don't know really what that is and yeah, that concept with yeah. the Wonder Lead? Right. It's a really effective tool. Um, it looks like, if you're familiar with anything to do with roping with horses, it looks like what they call a pig and string. It's a short length of stiff rope they use to tie the calf's legs up with. And the way it started, it was a total accident decades ago when it started. Um, of course, Delmer and his kids, they always had horses as well as dogs. And Delmer sent Rick as a little kid down to the kennel to get a dog. Rick couldn't find a leash, and so he grabbed a pig and string off the wall and made a loop out of it and led the dog up with that. And they thought, hey, this kind of works. And then they ended up, they make a specific rope. A pig and string doesn't work as well as the actual Delmer Smith lead does, the Wonder lead. So mm -hmm. it's developed, and it's over the years, it's changed. They keep adding little details and changing things up. But the way it works, it's such a stiff rope. It works far better than a choke chain or a pinch collar because the release is so immediate and it's a sharper sensation. When you use it, it's a real quick snap release and the release is immediate. You can actually push slack to the dog, which you can't do with a regular leash. At the time I saw it the first time, uh, I had a really tough, hard-headed little chessy female and I mean, she was on a pinch collar and she'd still have her way. And it was that first seminar I met Rick at, and I thought, okay, well, back then they were $20. I said, well, I'll throw 20 bucks at this, but I don't think it's going to do anything. And in 15 minutes with that lead on, she was saluting and saying, yes, ma'am, what would you like? And I thought, oh, they're onto something wow. with this thing. <laughs> and it kind of made a believer of me, but I was pretty, op pretty pessimistic that it was going to be of any value, and I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I didn't know the history of it with, with Rick going down there when he was young. That's, that's super yeah. cool. <laughs> that's the story he told me. So I'm assuming that's the version. You know, yeah. Just sometimes great things happen by accident and you've got to be able to look at it and roll with it. <laughs> right. I mean, another common method I see is the, like a rope of sort around the dog's snout. What, what's your feelings on that versus the wonder lead? That, okay. That, that, you mean the like the the one that the Smith used to use? I don't they call know. It a figure eight. Okay, I'm not sure if I don't know. Are you talking about those halty leads that people use? Well, I guess 
I guess touch on both of them. I don't like either one. Okay. Because <laughs> um, it's, it's ha- based on head control. Both of them, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, the, the figure eight is not. The figure eight is supposed to be for barking and, and misbehavior. I don't like it. Oh. Um, Ronnie doesn't use it anymore, and I don't think it's. I don't think it's a good thing. Okay. Um, that's my personal take on it. Um, okay. The halty leads, those the head collar ones that go around the nose, are hard on a dog's neck. You can't make a sharp correction without potential damage. And I think it's the lazy person's way to not have to learn how to teach their dog how to walk on a lead. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have yet to, at this point, and I've been, well, I've been doing this since 2004, so that's 17 years. Um, haven't met a dog I can't have walking at heel in less than 15 minutes on a loose lead. Hmm. Just using the wonder lead. Nice. And I'm assuming we can... I can send uh, listeners to a YouTube channel or something that demonstrates that well of how to, yeah. how to use that. Actually, um, when you gun dog supply sells them, I think we're all back ordered right now. I think the supply line is kind of backed up like everything else, but when you buy one, you get a DVD that instructs you how to use it. Nice. Okay. And that's automatically, it's a free thing that comes with it. Um, I had to laugh because a while back I needed to get some more leads and mine was getting kind of worn and Rick didn't have any yet. So while I was waiting for my shipment to come in, I had to quick order one from Gundog Supply and I was cracking up getting a DVD and instruction. (laughs) (laughs) They're at Gundog Supply, man. They have everything. They're, they're the best at what they do. They're good guys. They really are. So your your breed of choice is the Chesapeake Bay Retriever. How did that yes. come to be? Well, it had to do when I was married years ago in the very early 80s. Um, my ex, now ex-husband, had always wanted one. And I didn't know what a Chesapeake was. I had a, a lab mix, I think, was my first one. And, but being, you know, a, a wanting to be a good wife, I found one. Of course, this is pre-internet. So I found a leftover four-month puppy in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel classified section in the pets area and drove to Milwaukee and paid $75 and brought home a Chesapeake puppy. (laughs) And that dog from the day he walked in the door was mine. He never belonged to my ex. He was was with me 24-7. He was an amazing dog. I just was really addicted. Uh, very, very intelligent. Um, they're not right for everybody because they're a little too smart. Mm-hmm. And the the level of instinct really, really drew me strongly because if I if I compare the different breeds, and I don't like to generalize too much because there are always exceptions. But if you look at a Labrador, they were bred to be very, very trainable and follow directions. Chesapeake's were bred to go and pick up ducks and retrieve them without any instruction or help at all and then to guard the boat because they were used for the market hunters in the Chesapeake Bay. So the level of instinct of behavior is totally different between labs and chessies. Sure. So they it's have very, like very a, they have a protection component with them then as well. They do, but I think, you know, they have kind of a bad reputation from years ago. And I think as breeders, we've done a very good job of eliminating that grouchy old chessie that people always talked about. Sure. But Let's say um, if you've got a family and you've got kids and they're playing in the front yard and the scary guy with the van and the candy pulls up, he's not leaving with your kids. Hmm. You know, or if you have, there's a kind of a running joke that goes around. If you have a burglar break into your house, a golden retriever will show him where the good silver is, offer him a beer and carry out the TV set and then leave with him. <laughs> the lab will do the same, only the lab will be waiting for you when you get home. And with Chessies, all you find is a little blood on the doormat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like they're not mean dogs, but they will guard what they believe is there. Right. But There's, yet, and I but think, yet they will play in the yard with the children. Oh gosh, absolutely. And if, mm-hmm. if somebody comes in my house, if my dogs see, I'm okay with it, they'll walk over and want to be petted and act like any other dog. If I'm concerned, the dog will be concerned. Hmm. Interesting. Cause they, they're, they're just really in tune with you. Well, they're, they're, I, probably primitive, more primitive in instinct than most breeds. Okay. Interesting. I guess that's a good way to put it. Yeah. And what is it you like about their field ability or trainability versus other breeds that you have been consistent with that, with the Chessies? Oh gosh, they're just so easy to train because given any exposure to birds at all, they pick it up immediately. 
Uh, I will I will say compared to uh, labs and goldens, et cetera, or even the pointing breeds, the chessies are softer as far as training. Okay. People it's think just... you need a, you, well, you hear a lot. Oh, if you're going to have a chessie, you need a two by four to train it. Okay. And I will tell people I agree with that statement because if the dog isn't doing what you want, you hit yourself with a two by four and say bad trainer. You're not being clear. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you If you give the dog any exposure at all, they will pick things up so quickly. And okay. they do not like repetitive drill work. If you've done something a couple times and the dog's doing it right, move on. If you keep doing it, they're going to quit. They're going to go, I did it three times. Why? How many, have to, how many more do I have to do? Mm-hmm. They don't like the repetitive drill work. And you train all the different breeds, right? You're doing pointers. I do. Retrievers. Do you do spaniels as well? On occasion, yes. I've had several boykins in here. Oh, Cool. Um, and English cockers, they're a blast. Yeah, I just got they're one. So much fun. Oh, you are in for a treat. <laughs> I'm loving her already. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed with this little rocket of a puppy. He's like, it's very cool. Just so, do you have like a different approach for each of those different hunting types, or do you approach them the same? There are parts of it that are that are very definitely the same. I don't care if it's a retriever or a spaniel or a pointer. They all go in the chain gang. They all have to earn their way off the chain. They all work on the wonder lead. The basic obedience is pretty much the same. You know, obviously pointers are standing and the retrievers are sitting Mm -hmm. at heel. Um, And from there, the field work does change. You know, my whistle cues are similar up to like the breakaway cue for the pointing dogs is single blast on the whistle. For a retriever, that's a remote sit, turn and face me and sit. So there are some things, you know, as you start to branch out in more specialized areas, things will change a little, but the core foundation is the same. Okay. So at what point are you starting to make changes? As we get more into the field work. Okay. Um, example, retrievers, usually anytime after six or seven months when the basic obedience is solid, we can move right to force fetch. With the pointing breeds, I usually, and I'm again, I can't, I'm not going to generalize because it's never straight across the board. I will usually want them to go through their first bird season and just really get steady and solid on that point before I ask them to break to retrieve. Having said that, there are some dogs that are very natural retrievers. A Brittany I had was great about it. I never had to do anything to him. He was a natural retriever, and I'm not going to discourage it either. Mm-hmm. But for some dogs, especially the ones that really have a hard time holding steady, I think it's a little counterintuitive to say, stand still. Don't you touch that bird. Don't you get near that bird. Okay. Now go get that bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) It's a little bit, it's a little bit too much for some dogs. Every dog is an individual though. And I will train each dog as to what that individual needs and what their hundred percent capability is. And that makes my job interesting because every day is different. (laughs) Right. What is your thoughts on um, bird introduction? Like when you first get a new dog in for training, are you focusing more on establishing that uh, foundation, the obedience, the cooperation, uh, just the bond with them before you're introducing birds or are you putting birds on in, in their, you know, front of them right away? It depends on the dog. Uh, okay. if I get a dog in, uh, that is a little on the timid side and a little soft, I am not going to drill a ton of basic obedience. I'm going to get them out in the field and I'm going to toss pigeons for them until they're doing backflips with excitement. Mm -hmm. If I have a dog that looks me in the eye and says, are you good enough for today? My day to win the war. We're not going to go to birds right away. I need to have a level of control with that dog. Mm -hmm. And then there's the range in the middle. Now, when I raise a litter of puppies, I love quail for puppies because they're tiny little birds. They don't have big, flappy, scary wings for puppies. And I will pull the flight feathers on one wing, turn a quail loose in the field, and I'll let the whole litter just chase it and do whatever they want with it. There's safety in numbers, you know, so <laughs> puppies are all brave when it's a group. Mm-hmm. And they, they get the fire lit about being excited about chasing birds and getting birds. I'll do that. You know, if I get a young pointing dog in um, that hasn't had any bird exposure or a re- retriever, it doesn't matter. Then I'll use a pigeon, and we go through a lot of pigeons, hmm. just letting them get excited about birds first before I take the control. I want birds to be the most exciting thing in the world. And let's say, all right, I had a lab here for a lesson today. 
we always start with some basic obedience and then I turn the puppy loose. I mean, and basic obedience is walk it, heal, let's do all this stuff. Sit. Now we're going to work birds. The leash goes off, the lead goes off, and all the rules are gone. Hmm. Nothing they do on birds is wrong. I don't want to do anything to distract them from being really, really fired up and excited about birds. Right. Right. But every dog's different. You know, I might have three labs in and they'll all three get a different kind of bird introduction and basic obedience based on what they need on their personality and what they already know when they get here, too. Mm -hmm. You have a reputation of of taking on problem dogs (laughs) that that a lot of other trainers won't won't take in. And why why do you do that? I like the challenge. I like the the idea of getting into that dog's head and finding out why they do what they do. Why are they acting the way they act? What's the problem? And a lot of times I don't get the background story enough, so I've got to kind of work it out on my own. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I enjoy the challenge. Yeah. Um, years ago, I was doing a force fetch seminar in Oklahoma. And I got a call from a young pro trainer in Texas who'd been given a really, really well-bred black lab because it had a bad case of hard mouth. And when I say hard mouth, if you handed that dog a a hardwood one-inch hardwood dowel, you'd get a handful of toothpicks in about two chomps. Holy cow. He was serious about it. I mean, this was, and this young guy that got been given the dog, this was trainer number four. Mm. So he called and he said, here's what's going on. If I bring the dog, if I come to this seminar, will you help me with him? And I said, well, I'll try. You know, I haven't seen the dog yet, but yeah, I'll give it a shot. And one of the first things I do, and and people think I'm nuts, but it's the foundation for the whole force fetch process is mouth conditioning. And that's my hand in that dog's mouth. And the dog has to learn the grip I want, how to hold my hand. They're not allowed to chew. They're not allowed to bite. And they have to hold it until I tell them to let go. Hmm. And that usually with most dogs, you know, there's a little bit of a struggle to start with, but five or six minutes and we're, we're good. You know, then we can start doing that a little every day and it's easy. This dog, and I was wearing heavy leather gloves because I, I was expecting what I got. Oh my gosh. It was a 45 minute battle. And when I say battle, this dog was upside down, sideways, hanging from his toenails by the cable on the force fetch table. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was pitching a major fit and I, he was wearing me out. (laughs) <laughs> I wasn't yeah. sure how this was going to turn I out. I wouldn't put my hand in his mouth. I would have been scared after hearing what he did to the dowel. <laughs> well, well, yeah. And the other thing you don't know is the young guy had been using, because he couldn't use a wood dowel, he'd taken a one inch piece of steel pipe and wrapped it with a bunch of duct tape and the dog would bite that till his teeth bled. Holy cow. But the thing is, if you get your hand in a dog's mouth and I'm talking about palm down and the fingers just drape, you're not grabbing the jaw, you're just draping your hand in the dog's mouth. He can't bite as long as you push down on that jaw, on his lower jaw. Okay. He can try, but he can't, you know, he can't get enough pressure because you're pushing that jaw away from his upper teeth. Mm -hmm. So we, we won the war. It was a 45 minute and I was wore out by the time we got him to the point where he'd settle and take my hand and hold it. But by the end of that weekend, we could give that dog a live wing strap bird and he would walk the length of the table and not ruffle a feather. My gosh. And it had nothing to do with the pressure part of force fetch. It had everything to do with give up your mouth. Mm -hmm. And people think I'm nuts when I tell them that that's the basis of that the important part of the whole process. But it is. You have to teach the dog, here's what you're going to do. Your mouth no longer belongs to you. It belongs to me. And here's what you're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. They don't have the option. Right, right. So how does... If I can take that a step further, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. I get calls from people I don't know every fall. I've got a dog that's hard mouthed. Okay, what's going on? Well, he goes out and he gets a bird and he stops halfway back and he starts chewing it up and ripping feathers. And I say, you don't have a dog that's hard mouthed. You have a dog that doesn't know how to come when it's called. Uh They can't rip a bird up if they're running as fast as they can to get to you. They have to slow down and stop to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hard mouth isn't, a lot of times it isn't hard mouth. It's lack of control. You're right. Well, it's worked for me so far. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, and earlier you mentioned, um, you know, working with dogs that are a bit more shy, take a while to come around and, you know, get interested in birds. 
what is what is maybe like an approach or an experience you've had with that type of dog and how did you help build that drive in it if it would like say let's and let's I mean do you have an example of maybe an older dog like four or five years old that had never seen a bird in its life um and oh gosh yes how would you do that I can think of a dog and it actually it happened on a good day. Um, two friends of mine, both retriever people, Mary Howley from Candlewood Kennels and then Dennis yeah. White from Canada. Dennis is a, uh, he's an amateur, but he's a very well known. He's got a bunch of DVDs and stuff out. They were here and a dog came in that was, she was over a year old and she crawled off the truck. She was afraid of everything. I mean, she was, um, if you, she was afraid of a leash. If you held up a healing stick, she'd bolt. She was terrified of everything. And Mary and Dennis pretty much said, just find her pet home. She's never going to make it. Mm-hmm. Well, when you do that to me, it's like waving a red flag in front of a bull. <laughs> I will Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so with her, somebody had tried to start force fetch with her, but they went straight to pressure and that scared her completely. So I didn't use the word fetch. And what I did, I just took her out to the field. And if you turned her loose, she did like to run around, which was good. That that helped a bunch. And eventually, I got her to the point where she liked to chase birds. And then, I mean, we're talking a year into this before wow. it was all done. Mm-hmm. And I, when I started asking her to retrieve, she'd go pick stuff up, but she didn't want to come to you. She was intimidated and she was afraid. Um, I started using feeding time as a way to get her to hold something. So I had a wood dowel that sat, I kept her in the house with me and I had a a crate for her and that wood dowel stayed on top of the crate. And every time I wanted to let her out or she wanted to come out or she wanted to eat, she had to hold that dowel for a second or two before I'd release her to do anything. So that was her ticket to freedom or to food or anything else. And then I didn't use the word fetch because she had a negative connotation with that. I started using take it instead. Mm -hmm. And anyways, a year and a half later, um, we were through all this process and I had to make a, make a point of letting Dennis know that she had just gotten her first couple of hunt test ribbons. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, the problem is she needed more time and the average trainer is not going to spend any time with a the dog. They're just going to wash them out. It's sure. not going to make it done. So it, it, it depends on the person. Are they willing to give the dog the time it needs? Mm-hmm you know, will they go the extra mile? And this dog was worth it. She just had had so many bad experiences that we had to get those through. And the problem with those bad experiences, they're always still buried in the background. They never go away. You just have to make sure that you don't trigger whatever it is that might set them off. Mm -hmm. Because that would set them back again. Oh, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And the flip side of that one, there was another dog. Some people called me from Milwaukee and it was a big male Chessie. And they kept talking to me on the phone about it. And this dog sounded like an absolute terror. Hmm. Um, I mean, he was going after people. I mean, it was just, it just sounded like a train wreck. So I said, well, bring him up and let's take a look. And so I was loaded for bear when he got here. I was like ready for anything. I had a heavy jacket on, heavy gloves. And as they popped the back end of their SUV open, I kind of put my best alpha dog posture on as I walked over. The dog got out of that van and he stopped and looked at me. And as I got closer, he laid down and rolled over on his back. Wow. And okay, that's submission right off the gate, out of the gate. And so I I told the people, I said, you don't have a dog problem. The dog has a you problem. Mm -hmm. You know, you've allowed all this stuff. You've not stepped up. And as it turned out, they didn't want to either. They didn't want to step up. Mm -hmm. So they ended up giving me the dog to rehome. And he's got a great home. He's doing very well and people love him. But you have to at some point step up and say, okay, you know, playtime's over. There are rules and there are structures and there are boundaries. And as long as you stay within those, we're cool. Right. Right. I I feel like so many dogs are ruined just being in the wrong hands. Well, so that's many, true. So many good, good dogs. So many dogs with a lot of potential just, just because they weren't given structure. I shouldn't say the wrong hands. They're in the hands of people that won't provide the structure that they, that the dog needs. That's very true. And I think a lot of times people will tolerate way more from their dogs than they will their own children. 
their children have structure the dogs don't because they're afraid if they give the dog too much structure the dog won't love them anymore when the dog doesn't love them in the first place it just looks at them as a a source of food and shelter Mm -hmm. (laughs) it goes back to that respect or love topic right earlier that's exactly what i was just thinking too right right what are some of the other bigger dog issues that you've helped overcome that other trainers have struggled with? Oh gosh. Gun shy is a big one. Mm-hmm. Oh gosh. And the hard part with gun shy dogs, again, it, I get calls every fall. Some guy has a, usually it's a lab and they've dog has never seen a bird, never heard a gun. And he decides he's going to take a duck hunting with his buddies. And it sits in a duck blind and has a bunch of 12 gauge blasted over its head. Mm-hmm. Well, if you've ever been muzzle blasted, your ears will ring for three days and I can sympathize with that dog. And then they call me and say, if I drop him off for a couple of weeks, can you fix him? <laughs> no, we're looking at four to five months. Yeah. And it's because they didn't start. The dog had no clue what hunting or birds or gunfire was. Um, there are other dogs that sometimes it was an accident. Like one guy didn't, I always try to find out what happened. Why is this dog noise averse? One guy finally dug deep enough. He said, you know what? We were remodeling our basement and I had the puppy down there with me and I was using a nail gun. Mm. you know something or one other guy said I went down to shoot a rattlesnake and I didn't realize the puppy was right behind me mm-hmm. so you know there are little there always there's always a backstory some will admit it and some won't sure. um, I had one guy that argued with me his nothing he did made that dog gun shy it was born that way and they are never born gun shy mm. it's not possible so right. when he dropped the dog off I thought okay I've got to make my point here so as we're standing outside my kennel talking, his dog was already put in the kennel. Um, I'm talking. He didn't realize I had my hunting jacket on and I had my blank pistol in the game pouch. And as we're standing there talking, I just very surreptitiously reached into my game pouch and fired off two rounds. He didn't know it was coming and you should have seen the guy jump. Mm-hmm. And I said, why did you jump? He said, well, that startled me. And I said, yeah, and you know what gunfire is. How can you expect your dog that doesn't know what gunfire is to not jump and be afraid of it? Right. So sometimes you have to get a little creative to make your point. Well, and I think like in the NAVDA system, in the natural ability test, have you run dogs through NAVDA? I have trained dogs that have run through NAVDA. I've not run any myself. Okay. So there's a component where um, in in the field portion, after they leave the line, they will fire two shots and... And that is testing them for gun sensitivity. And there's there's this preconceived idea that that is to check if there is gun shyness in the pedigree, you know, an issue with the line. And it's the same thing in German testing. Um, you know, they, they test for that. And so is your... Your thoughts, can you just mentioned a little bit earlier that that is not something that lingers in the pedigree, that that is a wholeheartedly man-made issue? Well, some dogs are always going to be more sensitive to noise than others. Okay. But as far as actually a fear of guns themselves, of gunfire itself, that's it's not possible for that to be a genetic issue. They can be softer or more sensitive to noises, but it's not necessarily gun-related. And, you know, going back to your NAVDA scenario, I don't know a whole lot of those natural ability dogs that haven't been trained a bunch before they get there. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah. Well, there's, there are some, you know, when, when breeders require that the owners run the dog through it and you, you know, you don't necessarily have dedicated owners and still so they'll go, okay, to, you know, I'm signing up for the test, took the test. There you go. Are you happy breeder? And so even in that situation, uh, it'd be hard for me to, if a dog has never heard a gun or a loud noise in their life and you take it, turn it loose in a field and it hears two shots. I can't call that gun shy. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Um, how many dogs do you train at a time? Will you take in 10? No more than 10. Okay. And do you believe that they should be worked every day? How do you run your schedule? Yeah, they get something done with them every day, and that changes day to day. Okay. Uh, Normally, like if I'm working on force fetch with a dog, some dogs you can still take out in the field and run some marks with. 
Other dogs need to have the structure stay tighter so they don't make any mistakes when they're out in the field. So if they're, if I'm working a dog on force fetch, I might get that dog on the table three or four times a day for five or 10 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. I want to get something accomplished and then let them go think about it and then come back and do it again in an hour or whatever. So that, you know, that changes day to day. Um, it's such a mixed bag. You know, I never know what I'm going to have for dogs as far as where they're at in their retrieving stage. Are they, I have a bunch of retrievers this time, a bunch of pointing dogs this time. But what I try to do is do short little sessions several times during the day. And the dogs eat work at least five days a week, usually six. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they get something done with them every day. Um, and now that might be, let's say I've had a dog that I've been working on whatever skill set with. And they've really had a tough time getting through it. And finally, we have our big come to Jesus meeting if we need to. And they do it and we've had success. I'm going to put them away right then. And I'll probably let them sit for a day before I bring them back out. And that next time we're going to have, because they really, I do, I can't prove this and it sounds a little odd, but I think they sit and process and think about what just happened when they're back in their kennel. Okay. I think there's processing that goes on there. And then they come back. And they get it. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a dog. This is Chloe. This is a Chesapeake again. It was a client dog. The guy was going to have some major surgery. He was going to be out of commission for several months. And he said, now she's a year old. She needs basic obedience and force fetch. Mm -hmm. uh, I love working with Chessies especially. And I like every dog that comes in here. They're all fun. They're all different. This one really was testing me. She wasn't mean about anything. She'd just say, no not going to do it. Nope. Not going to do it. She had a ton of drive. She could mark really well, but she just didn't want to be a team player. And I got to the point where I, you know, I talked to the owner and I was looking at the calendar going, how much longer do I have to do this? And finally, one day I'd had enough. I said, you know what, Chloe, today's the day. And we had a little go around right by my force fetch bench. And I put her up. As soon as we were done with that, I put her away. And the next morning she came out of the kennel and said, Sharon, what would you like today? Let's whatever you want to do is fine with me. <laughs> and the switch flipped and it was, but that was, again, I had to evaluate that dog and finally get to the point where I said, okay, it's time. Right. But I didn't want to push until it was ready and until she was ready to handle that. And I actually got kind of teary eyed when she left because she was a blast to work once she got onto the program. Oh, interesting. It just took a bit to, to dig in and, and get connected with her. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. She's a little tough and that's okay. Yeah. But. What about those dogs that you're training and they just never screw up, you know, where you're like, I need to be able to get a correction out of you <laughs> oh, and you man. can't, and you can't get it. You know, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's I hard. Had those. I can think one again comes to mind. Um, it was a German short hair. Um, and it was, it's a funny story. They were, when they first bought her, it was a young couple and she wasn't old enough to be at a trainer yet, but they were driving all over Wisconsin talking to trainers and they got here and I got to meet the puppy and talk with them. We took a little walk in the field and they went right to their truck and wrote a check to reserve a spot. And I said, are you sure you don't want to talk to others? And they said no, and I had to ask why, and then I couldn't wait to call my mom and tell her. Um, I said, why me? They said, because you were the first one we talked to that seemed normal. <laughs> 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 mom, somebody called me normal, see? <laughs> anyway, so um, they booked her in, and the foundation stuff went so easily. You know, everything she did was with a smile on her face and a yes. You know, she was just so stylish and so easy to train. And I took her to Oklahoma with me that winter on my winter trip. And ran her with a couple of open all age pointers and three days in, they were having to back her. Hmm. Wow. She was just that good. So nice. the owners were already talking about now she's seven or eight now. And they're talking about what to get. And I said, don't get another short hair. And they said, why not? And I said, cause you're going to compare every dog you have to Gretel. Mm -hmm. Pick a different breed. So you don't compare because she's a once in a lifetime kind of dog. They just mm -hmm. don't come like that. Right. So, you know, let them roll. There's all, there's usually a way if you feel a need to make a correction, but most of the time I like to think of it as learning with, and if you don't have to make a correction in the dog's understanding, I don't always feel a need to push them. Mm -hmm. Well, and I just think, you know, cause you get them in a testing scenario and then weird stuff happens, you know, and so when you're kind of putting them through the motions during training, 
you, you just try to find what's going to happen in that testing scenario that I sure. can try to do now and get a correction out of you because you're just too dang perfect. <laughs> and you know, it's just apt to happen in a test. Oh, of course. Yeah. That's the only time it'll ever happen. <laughs> right. Right. Um, Sharon, you really embrace uh, the opportunities to help and ch- help women train their dogs. What, what kind of is the reason for that? Oh, you know, I think back to all the seminars I've attended. I don't know how I've lost count long time ago, about how many of Rick and Ronnie's seminars I've gone to. And there'll be 30 guys and one or two women. Mm -hmm. And the women are all very often a little intimidated. You know, they kind of hang in the background and they don't jump right in and do stuff. And I thought, you know, it's time to find some way that we can put together a group where these women can come and they don't, you know, it's a group of mostly, uh, it's all women. Um, one lady did bring her boyfriend. His name was Mike, but we told him he had to be Michelle for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's less intimidating. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know why they feel that way when they're in a group of guys, but they tend to do that. They'll hang in the background and really not put themselves out there like they would if they were in a situation with a bunch of other women. And I love seeing more and more women getting in the field and hunting and shooting and enjoying the outdoors and training their dogs. It's just, it's really uplifting. I enjoy seeing that success. Mm -hmm. Do you think women train differently than men do in general? In general, yes. In what ways? Yeah, I I think they're, they tend to be a little less um, eager to go right to pressure. Okay. Um, more patient. In general, I mean, I can maybe more patient. Yes. Okay. You know, I've, I've seen it in both, you know, both men and women, but I think women as a rule tend to be a little more patient, a little slower on the trigger. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you have a, a ladies bird dog workshop coming up that's happening right at your place in yes. Wisconsin Rapids. And yes. what are the dates for that? Uh, the dates are, it's the last weekend in August. Okay the it's like is it a two or a three day it's a three-day event the 27th through the 29th okay so what does that look like people are showing up on friday morning friday afternoon friday morning friday, friday morning. morning we start okay we start at eight friday morning we go till everybody's done with me on sunday whatever time that happens to be okay <laughs> so so what are some of the things that you are doing in the seminar through the weekend Workshop, well, we, I should say, right? Workshop? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I like to call it a workshop because really, if there, I like to keep these fairly small. I think there's more learning that happens if you're not dealing with 35 people, you know, if you can keep it to 20 and under. And it's usually 10 or 12, which is ideal. Um, we start with some of the basic foundation stuff and simple things like how to work a check cord. You know, at, at a regular seminar, somebody's going to hand you a check cord and say, okay, check cord your dog. Well, Mm -hmm. you've seen somebody do it, but you can't handle the rope. So, you know, we'll have, I have everybody hook their check cord to my fence and we learn how to just roll the rope back and forth over the dog before we ever put it on a dog. Mm -hmm. That way they can have success with the dog when they get to that stage. Um, We do a ton of lead work, a ton of check cording. We do a lot of bird work, um, intro to gunfire. If we have puppies, we'll do that kind of stuff. Um, it's and I focus a lot on everybody participating. So if you're at my class and you're working your dog, I want everybody else right behind us because I'm going to, after every dog we work and we work them all individually and everybody participates on every single dog, we're all going to go back, gather up, sit down and kind of go around the group and talk about what we saw and what we learned and what we, you know, kind of evaluate what you saw. And that way, everybody's thinking about, because just maybe because their dog isn't going to do that, it might tomorrow. You you start thinking about all the different things that can happen, and you see different dogs doing different things, and you start to be able to recognize um, mistakes, positives, how to make corrections, oops, missed that correction. You start to recognize it in somebody else, and then I think it's easier to correct yourself. Right, right. We spend a lot of time on that and a lot of time on body language and learning to read a dog. Okay. What about experience? Um, does the does the woman coming, does she need to have any kind of experience to attend? And what about the level of dog to bring? 
we have a range. We have people that have run, you know, master hunters. We have people that have run a bunch of NAVDA stuff, um, field trialers, beginners, total beginners, people with their first puppy. It's a range. And it's, it's fun because it's not all the same stuff. We're not running the same drill with every dog. Right. Mm-hmm. So we have a range. Everybody's welcome. And everybody's going to get something out of it. And the important thing I really try to emphasize is, you know, when you're up there working your dog in front of everybody, it doesn't mean we're not here to judge. This is not a competition. We're all here to be supportive of each other and encourage whatever's happening. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not like a typical going station to station where, okay, over here with so-and-so, you're going to learn a force fetch over there. You're going to learn steadiness. So you do, is everybody putting their dog on like a chain gang and then you're taking yep. out one dog at a time? Correct. Yes. Cool. That's awesome. It's a lot of fun. We really have a good time. And the, the, I'm not going to go into the details we had. <laughs> they decided they wanted shirts. Okay. <laughs> so I said, okay, what do you want? And I, I'm really big on not talking to our dogs. We talk, if you talk to them all the time, it becomes white noise. And so we, I do very little talking and very little verbal commands with the dogs and having people learn how to shut up <laughs> is hard. I've threatened more than one with duct tape. <laughs> um, so we get to the end of the weekend and we were going to get shirts. And so I said, what do you want on them? And this one lady piped up and she said, we should remember the three skills that a bird dog needs to know, which is go with you, come to you and stand still. Okay, good. And then she said, and shut the F up. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what the shirts say. And shut the f up. Yep, <laughs> that's that's like that's like the Sharon Potter rule, right? You're adding to evidently, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Is that in italics? <laughs> it's in very small print at the bottom. Oh, okay, <laughs> I guess that'd be more appropriate. Yeah, yeah, you have to look close. <laughs> That's very good. And I had a friend that attended, how, how long have you been doing this now? Is it two or three years? This is the third year. This is the third year. Okay. So I'm yes. not sure. Maybe she's attended your first two. I don't know. But I remember her telling me after she came back from it um, of how wonderful it was. And, and I'm like, well, what did you all learn? And, and uh, she had said, you know, just, just basic things that your dog should know. And she goes, you know, Sharon taught everybody how to have, make, get their dog to jump on the tailgate and get in their kennel. I'm like, well, that is clever. (laughs) Oh, you know, that is such a trip. Every year it happens. I see somebody lifting this big dog onto the tailgate of a truck. Right. And you know, it's different if you've got a dog that's older, has physical issues or whatever, or if it's a young dog that should not be jumping up, you know, because of their joints. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so simple. I give them a choice. I'm going to walk towards that truck and I'm going to cue with the lead when we get to that tailgate. And they have two choices. They can jump over the tailgate and into the truck or they can jump into the tailgate. And that's not comfortable. Mm-hmm. And they might hit it the first time. The second time before I even have a chance to cue, they're hopping onto the tailgate and jumping in the truck. Wow. It's so easy. So is, it, <laughs> is this going to be a similar method as you use when you teach a horse how to trailer? No, completely different. Okay. <laughs> yeah, with a, with a horse. I, lo- I used to love teaching horses how to load and trailer. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I, it's, it's similar to what I do with the dogs, but it's, it's kind of polar opposite when you look at it. I like to let dogs and horses make a choice. And whatever choice they make, I enforce that choice. They made the decision, now I'm going to back it up. So if I get a horse up to the trailer and they decide they want to stop and back up, cool, let's back up. If we go two, 300 yards, is that enough? And then they want to stop. They don't want to keep backing up because it kind of took the fun out of the game. So then I asked for a step forward. And a horse that won't load in a trailer is a horse that really isn't as broke to lead as people think it is. Mm-hmm. So I teach it to go forward. When, I, when they hear me clock to it, it means go forward right now. And then I want one foot in and back out and two feet in and back out. And then we're going to back up a little bit and go forward again. And I want them to not have to go all the way in in one shot, learn that they can get in and can get out. Because if you think about it from the horse's perspective, they see this narrow little box with no escape route. Mm-hmm. You know, backing out of a trailer is, is not a natural thing for a horse to do. So I want them to understand that they can get out and here's how they get in. And it goes pretty easily. 
So with a dog in the tailgate, it's the exact opposite. We're applying pressure and saying, you're going to go forward or here's what happens. Can't okay. do that with a horse. They're too big. Okay. And horses aren't smart enough to realize that if they rear and hit their head on the top of the trailer, it's going to hurt. Right. <laughs> I'd right. rather not have that bills. Yeah. So I let the animal make the decision and I enforce it. If the dog doesn't want to go, well, there's a tailgate, jump over it or jump into it. It's your call. Mm -hmm. But you're going forward one way or the other. And with the horse, if you want to back away, fine. I'll decide when you stop. So they, if they're not jumping in, if the dog isn't jumping onto the trailer, you're, you're forcing them or you're putting a pressure there? Well, I'm going to walk at a pretty brisk pace right to it. And just as I get to the spot about a step and a half before that tailgate, I'm going to give an upward jerk on the lead and kind of cue them up. Okay. And they're either going, they're going to come off their front legs for sure. And then okay. it's up to them whether they jump over or into. So do you provide rewards for behavior or are you just reacting of good? That's what you're supposed to do. It depends. Um, food rewards are great with young dogs and puppies. I'm all about that. That's super stuff, but we don't want to be walking vending machines. Mm -hmm. And I would same thing. I don't use grain to lure a horse into a trailer either. That's counterproductive. Um, so really the cessation of pressure in the comfort zone, the dogs and horses are always going to look for what makes them comfortable. That's the biggest reward you're going to have. But another thing that's, excuse me, that's very similar between dogs and horses. They're like, we are when they're tense, they tighten their jaw. They're kind of lock their mouth. And with a horse, if you put your thumb in their mouth or your finger in their mouth, right where the bars are, where there's no bit, where the bit would sit, where there's no teeth and rub and work their tongue, you can get them to relax their jaw and start to lick and chew. And you can get the dog to do a similar thing. You've got to get them to relax their jaw and then they kind of let that tension go. You know, a horse that or a dog that's afraid is going to lock their jaw and you're not going to get much from them until you can get them to relax, take a breath and go, all right, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. With your workshop, um, people also have the option to just come and audit as well, right? Correct. Yes. So if you have someone flying in, doesn't want to bring the dog, they, they can just come in and watch and take notes. And do you, that, I mean, that's got to yes. be just as beneficial to, to do oh, sure. that than it would be to have your dog there. Maybe even less sure. distracting. Yeah. I, I had a, a lady that did that two years ago. She just came and watched. She didn't bring a dog. And, it, you know, there is a fee for that, but it's not like it is with the, with the, with the dog included. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. You know, there's a lot of learning that goes on. You know, I think of all the seminars I've sat through with Rick. Um, they pick up something in everyone. There's always more to learn. You never stop. Right. And you, st that's, you said this is limited for the number of people that can attend. Do you still have openings for it then? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So listeners, it, I wouldn't hesitate. <laughs> we do get, have a lot of fun. Get signed up. Yeah. Now, there is another side benefit of this if you want to take advantage of it when people come. I'm a mile, just a little over a mile from the start of the Buena Vista grasslands up here. And the Buena Vista grasslands is 15,000 acres that's managed strictly for prairie chickens. We can't hunt them, but we can go out and run on the prairie and train on those wild birds. And so I have mm -hmm. access to that for, in the evenings for people. Nice. If they want to go out, because we finish up at four every day and there's still plenty of daylight. So if people want to go out there, you know, I provide maps and they can go out and run their dogs on wild birds if they want to. Nice. So you're not, you're not going out there and doing training at that no. point. You're just letting, I mean, even so just to give the dogs the opportunity to go air out, you know, after, Correct. after the but, day. Yeah, they're on their own for that one, but it's just, mm -hmm. a, it's just another little perk they can use if they want to. Yeah. A great opportunity to get on wild birds. Awesome. Yeah, it's one of, the, one of the benefits of being where, living where I live. That's one of the reasons I bought this place is the proximity to wild birds. Nice. Um, all right. Well, what is some of your best training advice for a novice or even experienced person? Go slow. Take your time. Don't push. Throw the timelines out the window. You know, when somebody says, well, by time your puppy's 12 weeks old, it should be doing this. Not necessarily. Take your time, go slow, let the dog really learn one skill before throwing the next thing at it. Don't try to do everything at once. 
you know, just because a dog has done something correctly a time or two doesn't mean it knows it. It's just guessing right at that point. Mm -hmm. Really solidify the lesson before you move on to the next thing. Take your time and go slow. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, how can how can listeners find out more about the Ladies Bird Dog Workshop and how can they find and connect with you? Well, they can find me on Facebook at Red Branch Kennels or at Sharon Hanson Potter. Uh, either one of those works great. My website is www.redbranchkennels.net. Um, there's information there and you can email me from there or give me a call on the phone either way. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, share it and tag me and someone that would benefit from listening. And hey, help a girl out by giving the podcast a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening from. Send me a screenshot of your review and I'll mail you out a Bird Dog Babe sticker. Be sure to join me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you're interested in some Bird Dog Babe swag or gear that I rely on, be sure to check out the store on thebirddogbabe.com. And most importantly, don't forget to support the sponsors of this podcast and the organizations that are working hard to conserve the birds you're chasing after and the public lands in which you hunt.